Good day. In recent videos, I have discussed the coordination that is now clearly taking place between the Russians and the Chinese in diplomacy, and specifically I discussed that coordination and cooperation at a recent UN Security Council meeting at which the Russians and the Chinese both supported the principle of international law as opposed to the US-backed and conceived uh, rules-based international order favoured by the US and the West. I have also discussed in recent videos the growing self-confidence, exhilaration if you prefer, buoyancy almost, that the Chinese are bringing to their conduct of diplomacy. They are showing increasing signs that they are in the ascendant and feel themselves to be so, and that they have the United States and, its, and the West essentially on the run. I think that this is explained by three factors. Firstly, there is obviously that enormous growth of Chinese power which we have witnessed over the last 30 years. This is underpinned by the enormous expansion of the Chinese economy. It is now the biggest manufacturing economy in the world by far. It has the biggest GDP by purchasing power parity terms. It is likely to surpass the US in nominal GDP by the end of this decade and probably by 2028, which is only seven years away. Um, it is the biggest trader in hard goods, um, uh, manufactured goods and raw materials, having overtaken the US in that capacity back in 2013. China is also, of course, an increasingly strong technological and scientific power, as shown by the recent successful uh, landing of a Chinese uh, spacecraft, automated spacecraft, on Mars. That's one factor, perhaps in some ways the more Im most important ones. But there are two others. The other is a sense which became very clear, by the way, at that ill-starred summit in Anchorage, where Secretary of State Blinken and his foreign policy team met with the Chinese, um, um, that the US political system is now increasingly in a state of decay, uh, bereft of ideas, drawn to utopian thinking, which is becoming increasingly detached from reality, absorbed by its internal conflicts, no longer with a clear plan forward for how to take things, how to, how to meet the challenges it faces around the world. The Chinese see that this political system, as they would describe it, is losing its competitive edge and is becoming less attractive around the world. But the third factor, I think, is the one which explains this very recent feeling of buoyancy we see from the Chinese. And I think it is explained, and I think it is the one that explains, more than any other, the latest outburst of Chinese self-confidence. This is that over the last year, the Chinese believe that they have sealed the deal with Russia, that from now on, Russia is their ally in an unbreakable partnership with them. Now, this is something which I think many people in the West don't really understand. I think that many people in the West, at least within the sort of commentary class and the political class, think two things about this strategic partnership. Firstly, I think they see it as somehow unnatural and don't believe that it can really happen. They suppose, going back to the era of Soviet-Chinese confrontation in the 1960s, that it is not really underpinned by trust or by a long-term um, 
engagement and that at some point it will spl splinter and crack asunder and is not really going to maintain a sustained challenge towards the West. I remember some time ago seeing in The Economist, a British magazine, current affairs magazine, which has a rigidly Atlanticist viewpoint a reference to China and Russia being supposedly the best of frenemies. Friends to, in appearance, but enemies in reality. And I think there are many people, far too many people actually, who think that. The other view, which I think is also completely wrong and has completely misunderstood the origins of this relationship between China and Russia, is that this is somehow a relationship which the Russians have forged as they have found themselves in confrontation with the West. A classic expression of this is a recent article which appeared a few weeks ago in the Daily Telegraph by the Oxford academic Mark Armand, and it, it explains the entire Chinese-Russian strategic partnership purely in terms of Russian foreign policy and of Russia's confrontation with the West. I, I'm going to read it simply as an example of what it means. And it says the following. As Western relations have soured with Beijing so dramatically since the emergence of the pandemic and the disputes about its origins in China and how the communist regime mishandled its response to the pandemic, Russia has seen an opportunity to boost its strategic position. Fifty years ago, Washington played the China card to isolate Moscow. Now, now the Kremlin and Beijing hope their cooperation will trump American power. By offering China a strategic hinterland stuffed with the natural resources Beijing's economy needs, Russia is able to boost its own position on its front with Europe. Reorienting, reorientating its gas and oil exports to China gives Moscow revenues which US sanctions cannot hit. It also is securing Beijing against similar problems if Washington acts on the Taiwan or Uyghur issue. Now, that places this entire framework of the Chinese-Russian strategic partnership entirely within the framework of Russia's confrontation with the West. It makes Russia the main driver and player in forging this relationship and implies that it is somehow a manipulative relationship hit upon, the, hit upon by the Russians, by President Putin and his officials, in order to counterbalance the pressure they feel themselves to be under from the West as they conduct their hostile actions against the West. It is an outlook which is still shaped by the Cold War when the Soviet Union, Russia, was the West's major challenger and adversary. In my opinion, it is almost completely wrong. It gets this whole issue entirely the wrong way round. All along, ever since the Russian-Chinese friendship or strategic partnership first began to emerge in the early, late 1990s and early 2000s, it has been obvious to me that it is Beijing, China, that has been the suitor, and Russia, which has been the far from easily persuaded bride. If we go back to the early years of Putin's presidency. At that time, President Putin obviously wanted to have 
good relations with China. Why wouldn't he? But his primary focus and that of the entire Russian elite was in developing a closer relationship with the West. That was the time when the Russians were still talking about Europe as their common European home, when uh, um, Putin was inviting um, the EU uh, Commission President Barodo, Barroso to meet him in Vladivostok, and, and Barroso was talking rather ludicrously of Vladivostok as being also part of Europe. He didn't look at the map, apparently, but there we are. And where the Russians, and Putin himself specifically, were seeking to forge close relations with certain European leaders, like Silvio Berlusconi of Italy, Gerhard Schroeder of Germany, and Jacques Chirac of France. That was, at that time, the major focus of, of Russian policy. And, of course, the Russians at that time were um, borrowing money uh, through their financial system from the Europeans, from European banks, especially in, on the financial markets in Frankfurt. They were floating their companies on the London stock market, as I very well remember. Their, um, uh, uh, their oligarchs were investing in the London property market. And all the indications were that the Russians conceived of themselves as advancing forward towards an ever closer relationship with the Europeans especially, but also ultimately with the United States. In those days, the Russians were increasingly becoming annoyed by certain US actions, the decision by the US to extend NATO membership to the Baltic states, for example, the US decision to uh, cancel the anti-ballistic missile treaty and to employ ballistic missile interceptors in Eastern Europe, and of course, US backing for the so-called Orange Revolution in Ukraine, which took place in 2004, and the or Rose Revolution that at the same time took place in Georgia. But despite all those irritations and annoyances, the Russians still hoped that these were transitional and that eventually Russia would be able to develop an ever closer relationship with Europe and with the West. I would add that at that time also, the Russians had certain issues with China. This was the time when the Russians essentially stopped selling arms to China because they became increasingly irritated at the way in which the Chinese were cost copying Russian arms systems like the Suhoi um, 27 fighter jet, without which the Russians had sold to China and were producing copies of that aircraft themselves without respecting Russian copyright, uh, um, copyright titles to those aircraft designs. So there were tensions with China at that time. There were also uh, tensions, obviously, with the West. But the main focus of Russia and of its policies at that time was with the West. Of course, in those days, you, Russian trade with China, with, with Europe, dwarfed that of Russian trade with China. At that time, it was Europe which was not just Russia's primary export market for its oil and gas, it was almost the only export market for Russia's oil and gas. Well, what has changed is that, of course, the Russians have found, ever since the first wave of sanctions started to be imposed upon them in 2013, the so-called Magnitsky Act, but as was massively escalated after 2014, that a a reasonable relationship with the Western powers is simply impossible and that they will never accept Russia on equal terms. And that is why they have turned to China and have become increasingly receptive 
to China's offers of partnership. And it is essential to understand that it is from China that those offers of partnership have always come. The Chinese have always understood that it is Russia which is the big prize. It is the country with a strategic nuclear force comparable to that of the US, with powerful armed forces, an enormously powerful scientific uh, and industrial um, 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 uh, complex, and of course almost limitless natural resources, and which holds the key to Chinese ability to dive to um, di divert away, to uh, um, expand away from their dependence on the sea routes through the South China Sea for their imports of raw materials and their exports of finished goods. Um, so it is the Chinese who have consistently driven this relationship it is the Russians who have been sceptical of it. What has happened over the last year or so is that the Chinese have concluded, and I think concluded absolutely rightly, that the Russians have decided that there is really no point in holding out for better relations with the West. The Russians have watched with horror and dismay and bewilderment the whole Russiagate uh, um, scenario unfold in the United States. They've seen the extraordinary outbursts of Russophobia, both in the United States and in Europe, and they've decided that any conceivable relationship with the West is, for the moment, a complete non-starter. Also, as their relationship with China has warmed, the, China, the Russians have increasingly seen the obvious benefits of it, the extent to which China can indeed replace the West as a market for Russian goods, for Russian oil and gas, for, uh, Rus uh, uh, and for Russia's other vast resources of strategic uh, uh, minerals, of food, of timber, of what you will. Lastly, as the Russians have pressed forward, developing the Northern Sea Route, they've gradually come to understand that it is China and its merchant navy which will probably want to be the country that will use it most. So, gradually, the Russians have come round to the idea that this alliance with China, this de facto alliance with China, is not only uh, something which is an alternative to this relationship which they previously sought with the West, but is in fact something which is extremely good on its own terms. It also cannot have escaped the Russians of the extent to which having China as an ally has massively enhanced their leverage in dealing with the Europeans and with the United States. I've also discussed in recent videos the extent to which, over the last year or so, the Russians have become increasingly forceful in their responses to the US and to the Europeans on a range of issues. And I'm going to say that I suspect the breaking point was the Navalny affair. The Russians were absolutely outraged when there was talk in the West and in Germany as well, of the Nord Stream 2 pipeline being cancelled because of the uh, Navalny episode. And they were utterly infuriated at the campaign that was whipped up, as they saw it, around Navalny, with the clear indications, once more, of the West's determination to meddle in their internal affairs. I suspect that for the Russians, this was ultimately the make or break issue, the point of no return with their relations with the West, 
they decided that from this point on, any idea of better relations with the West were a complete non-starter, and that this reliance with China was for Russia the only way forward. I suspect that this has also been communicated by the Russians to the Chinese, and I predict that whether or not a meeting between Putin and Biden happens over the next few weeks, a meeting between Putin and Xi Jinping is now an absolute dead certainty and that it will happen within the, new, the next few weeks for sure. So this explains why the Chinese feel so confident. And we've had an expression of this in another remarkable editorial in the Chinese newspaper Global Times, a English language newspaper published by the People's Daily, which is the official newspaper of China, China's Communist Party. And I'm going to read a few of the paragraphs in that um, editorial because I think they're remarkable in setting out the position that the West now faces in, in confronting China and Russia together. Um, and I've never again seen them expressed so forcefully and in such strong terms. And this is what it says. There are signs that US political elites have either recognised or anticipated the ageing and declining competitiveness of the American and Western way of governance and are well aware that they are no longer capable of launching substantial reform. They hope to create a fundamental opposition with which they can forcibly create an international system dominated by Western countries, excluding China and Russia, and maintain the hegemony of the US with the existing economic and technological stock advantages of the West. They hope that this new pattern will evolve through one conflict after another with China and Russia. What this describes, in effect, is the US attempts to create this so-called rules-based international order, which I've discussed at such length. It's this attempt to create an international system which, with the United States at its centre, to which all countries, including ultimately China and Russia, are subordinate. Anyway, the newspaper, the editorial, goes on to say this. We need to warn Washington that it is playing a strategic game with fire and that it will never succeed. The combined power of China and Russia is far greater than that of the former Soviet Union Eastern European bloc. The economic, scientific and military strength of China and Russia is not only huge in scale, but also has wider implications for the whole world. If anyone tries to ride roughshod over this fact and pushes China and Russia to join forces in a desperate fight, that must be its nightmare. Both China and Russia are strategically restrained. They are committed to upholding the international system and the Charter of the United Nations at its core and the international order based on international law. Both countries, China and Russia, have very specific frictions left over from history with their neighbours and both countries have exercised restraint. If the US and the West want to encourage individual countries to confront China and Russia, they will bring disaster to them. China and Russia are working patiently to solve the problems, the problem. We hope that no country or political force will be tempted by Washington to attack China and Russia like throwing a straw, 
against the wind. So there it is. It's a absolutely clear statement of the reasons why the Chinese feel so confident at this time. To repeat again, they are the combined power of China and Russia is far greater than that of the former Soviet Union Eastern European bloc. The economic, scientific and military strength of China and Russia is not only huge in scale, but also has wider implications for the whole world. Um, any country or political force tempted by Washington to attack China and Russia will be throwing a straw against the wind. The Chinese have calculated that with Russia at their side, with those enormous strategic resources that Mark Armand in the Daily Telegraph was talking about, they are unstoppable. And they're pointing out to the Russians that the same is true of them also. And of course, this article isn't just a warning to the West. It is also a warning to other countries too. It is a warning to countries like the Baltic states and to Ukraine, which might be thinking of taking on the Russians. And of course, it is also a warning to countries like India and Taiwan and China uh, and, sorry, and Japan and possibly Australia, which might be tempted to take on uh, China. Com faced by the aggregate power of Russia and China, such a move would be like throwing a straw against the wind. They would be completely overwhelmed. The Chinese and the Russians are exercising restraint at this time because with their aggregate power, which is growing all the time, they feel that they have time on their hands. And they are, besides, countries that are minded to exercise restraint. But no country should push that too far. Certainly not be, be encouraged except any temptations from Washington to pursue that. Because if they do, they will find themselves facing a strategic nightmare. They will be overwhelmed. And it isn't just, of course, other countries, Ukraine, the Baltic states, possibly Britain, India, Japan, Taiwan, Australia, that find themselves in that position. It's also the United States also. It too cannot take on the Chinese and the Russians at the same time. The challenge it is facing from the Chinese and the Russians is far greater than the one it faced during the Cold War because the aggregate resources of the Russians and the Chinese are immeasurably greater than those of the old Soviet Union and its Warsaw Pact allies. In my opinion, this is an exact and precise summary of the present facts. Moreover, it is one that is going to become increasingly apparent over the next few years. I am aware that many people talk about China having growing economic problems. They talk about China's ageing population, even though it's actually continued to grow this year, and of the large amount of indebtedness within China. All these problems are real. Every country has economic problems. But the momentum is still for the Chinese economy to continue to grow, and I expect it to continue to grow at a very rapid rate, rate for many years to come. Moreover, Russia is going to see its economy start to pick up speed at an accelerating pace from now on as the Russians complete that massive reordering of their economy, which they started, they embarked on around the time of the Ukrainian crisis in 2014, with the reorganisation of their financial system, their import substitution programme, their new technological uh, uh, um, development, all of which I'm going to discuss shortly in another programme. 
we're going to start to see soon the Russian economy, whose growth, by the way, people underestimate anyway, we're going to see it very soon start to pick up speed. We're also going to start to see growing imbalances in the military balance of forces. We have discussed in programmes that have happened on this channel the growing scale of the Chinese naval challenge to the US in the Pacific. We're shortly going to see a similar growth of the Russian naval challenge to the US in the North Atlantic as the Russians forge ahead with their submarine and anti and, uh, and uh, um, submarine drone programs, which are gradually accelerating and are moving into ever higher gear. This is a strategic challenge which the United States simply has no real answer to if it continues to challenge China and Russia in the same way. Now, I think that the US at some level understands that. We saw that even in Mark Armand's article in The Telegraph, even if he hasn't really explained it well. But I'm going to say something further. I think that any idea that the United States may have to try to detach Russia from China is now hopeless. I think that the days when that might have been possible are long gone. I think the Russians were increasingly sceptical to that idea um, after the Ukrainian crisis of 2014. I don't think they trust the US any longer, and I don't think they have any confidence in any stable, long-term relationship with the US or with its European allies. The only way forward for the US is to accept this new strategic reality, which is that it is going to be faced for the foreseeable future by an alliance system that is mightier than itself. That doesn't mean that the United States itself is directly threatened. What it does mean is that the United States needs to accept that it no longer can be, by any stretch, the world hegemon, that this concept of the rules-based international order that he talks about is a dead letter, that it needs to accept that it is one of a concert of great powers, with the Russians and the Chinese being the other two, and that it needs to work with them on the basis of equality and a recognition of mutual red lines in order to maintain peace. Now, I'm going to discuss what that means in future videos, but in terms of the change in the strategic balance, that is what I'm going to say. This is all I'm going to say in this video today. I hope I've summed up the massive change, the enormous shift that's happened in the international balance of power. The Russians are still guarded about talking about it. The Chinese, with their far greater confidence and their sense that things are heading in their, their way, are talking about it openly. Washington needs to listen and to think its implications through. And by the way, so do Washington's allies, especially those in Europe but also in the Far East too. Thank you for joining me on this programme, on this important subject. I look forward to you joining me in future, ch uh, future programmes, both on this channel and our main channel, The Duran. You'll find links under this video, including links to our other platforms, uh, um, BitChute, SuperTube, Odyssey and Locals. And of course, also, if you want to support or like this channel, please also look us up on Patreon, Subscribestar and PayPal and support us there however you feel you can. Remember, we accept donations and payments in all currencies, including the new electronic ones. Likewise, don't forget to come to our shop, 
see the wonderful things we have there, our famous magic mugs, our t-shirts, our sweatshirts, our hats, uh, uh, our hoodies and all the rest, and also check out our Discord server. Please also remember to check out our, to, to check your subscription to this channel and to our other channels and to tick the like box if you've liked this video. Thank you for joining me and I look forward to you joining me again and have a wonderful day.